We have Antonio Gomez. Antonio is a browser hacker with past experience in both Firefox and WebKit, focusing on Chromium development for some years now. Uh, he works at Igalia. And Max is also a software engineer at Igalia with expertise in various subcomponents of Chromium, including embedding, portability, tool chains, and desktop integration. Today, Max and Antonio are going to talk about the journey towards stabilizing Chromium's Wayland support. All right, now, yeah. Thank you for the introduction, Rocky. Um, also, thank you to Martin for the presentation on how Firefox is doing things. And also for, um, I was hoping that you would talk about Wayland in a bit more general sense, so we can have a bit more time for the very interesting <laughs> history lesson that uh, Antonio will give. So um, first of all, the agenda, f agenda for today, um, first, I will talk a bit about the relevant architecture parts of Chromium, the different layers, how they work together. Um, and then, yes, as mentioned, Antonio will give a history lesson on how Wayland support evolved in Chromium. It is a very interesting adventure, I think. And then I will talk about what the current status is of Wayland support in Chromium, and finally, uh, what no work still needs to be done so we can officially ship Wayland as stable. So let's start, start with the architecture. Um, I've included the paths if you are interested and want to take a look yourself at the code. Um, let's go from high level to more low level. Of course, the highest level is Chrome slash browser with all the high level browser code, which is using the views desktop UI toolkit, um, which does all the rendering and layout and event handling, um, has most of the UI element definitions that the browser uses. And then on Windows and Linux, Views is using the Aura framework for windowing and event abstraction. Uh, if you're familiar with GDI or GTK, GTK it's basically a platform independent replacement for that. And then finally, on Linux, Aura is using Ozone as one final layer of platform abstraction. And then there's some glue in, in UI slash platform window between Aura and Ozone. So let's take a closer look at Ozone. This is a very simple uh, architecture diagram. We have Aura on the top left calling into Ozone to do all the low-level input and graphics handling. And the nice thing about Ozone is that you can compile in support for different platforms, and then you can select the platform that you want at runtime, for example, via this Ozone platform command line argument. Um, and Ozone is, is very nice, um, also for downstream, because in theory, at least, you just need to implement the public interface that Ozone exposes to Aura for your custom platform, and you just brought up a new platform that Chromium can run on, as long as it's Linux-based. Um, I say in theory because in practice, of course, if your platform doesn't meet all the expectations that Ozone currently has, it won't work. Like, as you saw before in the relevant code areas, we had to touch a lot more code than just inside of Ozone, because Wayland violates so many expectations that uh, the browser has. For example, we can completely control the window position and things like that. Um, and yeah, also you can see the three most important Ozone platforms that currently live in, in Upstream. We have, of course, Ozone Wayland. X11 also runs via Ozone nowadays. And finally, Ozone DRM is something that is mostly relevant for, for Chrome OS. And now, Antonio is doing the history lesson. Yes. Uh, so when we talk about this journey that we've been, um, you know, for some time to get Wayland, to get Chromium running natively on Wayland, I think it makes sense to mention that we're talking about different companies, different years, and even different decades of the development. So we try to do a little bit of storytelling on this because uh, maybe Firefox folks, they have also run 
into something similar and that spans over various years. So the idea is to go from the very beginning. In 2013, so 11 years ago, uh, some folks at Intel, they've uh, came out with this project called Crosswalk. And Crosswalk was a runtime back then, so it was running web apps, and one of their target systems was Wayland-based. So they had uh, the web runtime based on Chromium, and they had a uh, Wayland-based target. So they wanted to have Chromium running natively on Wayland. So they started to actually port this stuff on top of the ozone abstraction layer that Max has just mentioned. So we had a good community adoption, had, had kind of a, a, a hype around it, and people were talking about it. So different projects started to also use it. One of them, for example, is the so-called Tizen uh, operating system. It was primarily developed by Samsung already 2014, 2015. And it was also based on another uh, windowing uh, toolkit, which is the EFL. So Tizen had to run on top of this Wayland ecosystem and a different uh, GUI as well, EFL. So they have took what Intel had originally, they've kind of forked, and they kept developing on their own. So we had already two implementations syncing up, going side by side, one being run by Intel, the other one by the Tizen Fox. But eventually, both projects, they've entered kind of maintenance mode or community-driven effort mode circa 2015, 2016. So to give you an idea, this is happened uh, in milestone 49 of Chromium. Today, we are on milestone 100. Uh, 27, I think that's tip of trunk. 25, I think. 25 is, is, is stable, stable yeah. right? Yeah, 26, 27 is beta and uh, bleeding edge. So, uh, meanwhile, having Intel, the Tyson Fox, we also started to see things happening in tip of trunk Chromium. So, we have saw this first commit taking place in Chromium upstream, and we've at Igalia, uh, built that because we wanted to see where things were. And basically, we verified that the Chromium Fox, they had a different goal than the one we were originally working at Tizen and Intel and all that. So basically, you can, you can switch. Uh, the Chromium Fox, the upstream Google Fox, uh, they wanted to have the Chrome OS development shell that they use daily available on Linux so that they can test things uh, locally using Wayland. That's what they wanted. So if we actually run that back then, 2016, we're not going to see a browser as we just see today and we use today. We were actually going to see a development shell of Chrome OS with various widgets here. We have buttons, we have icons, we have the tray over there. And the browser itself was just another widget running on top of this shell. This is not what we wanted. But that's what we had available upstream. So we started to study a little bit deeper what had underneath things. And we learned about the so-called MUS uh, windowing system that the Chrome OS folks were working on. So basically, they called it MUS plus ASH, MUS ASH. And it was a built-in windowing system targeting Chrome OS where they want to have everything related to UI uh, residing on their own service. So they could isolate everything running, uh, you know, and lower level close to the UI on their own service. And we wanted to have something for that, for something like that for desktop, but not quite the way uh, they had it. So we've uh, discussed with this person, Robert, uh, he is a previous Google employee, and he said, okay, that's the way we want to go forward. If you want to desktop Linux with Chromium Wayland, you have to uh, adapt and implement uh, things on top of most Tash. And that's what we did. We've launched a downstream project. We've put together a prototype. And in 2017, we have came to Fosden, and we've met this guy, this second guy over there, Re Riverman, David Riverman. 
And uh, he was a Google employee working on Chrome OS, particularly on a built-in Wayland compositor for Chrome OS. So basically, uh, in Chrome OS, they run Chrome OS apps, but in the future, they would be able to run Linux apps on Chrome OS on top of this built-in Wayland compositor. So with Matt, it was, OK, you have uh, Chrome you're running on desktop. We have uh, the compositor on Chrome OS. That's good stuff. But we did not connect too much. But that's for the future. We're going to connect. Uh, and after the bring up, the prototyping, we've presented the work in one of the BlinkCon conferences. Uh, we've met uh, with the Google folks and stakeholders again, Robert and this other person called Sky. And they said that mustache was being deprecated. You have to work everything out uh, based on a different uh, implementation. So that's what we did. We reworked things on top of all our views that Max has mentioned. And we ended up with our third design for Chromium on Wayland. The first one from Intel and Tizen, the second one on top of Mustache, and the one that we reworked, which was the final one. And if we look, there is one key difference between the first implementation from Intel and the implementation that is still sitting in upstream today. In Intel's implementation, they used to connect with Wayland from the GPU process. And from that point, mustache on, for security reasons, we have to rework everything that connects and you know, uh, talks to Wayland to move back to the browser process for security reasons and uh, other concerns. So uh, we are ready in 2019. And Chromium on Wayland was getting, again, uh, some hype. It was stabilizing things, but we had the Chrome, the Ozone Wayland backend, we had the Ozone X11 backend, and we have the stock Chromium browser that everyone uses. When you install your distro, it comes with a Chromium uh, X11. And we knew that if we want Ozone to actually fly, we would have to get what users uh, use today and put our sort of work with Ozone X11. So we spent quite some work consolidating the existing Chromium X11 implementation to run on top of the Chromium Ozone abstraction layer implementation. Uh, in parallel to this, we've also worked on splitting. And actually, properly, it was already split, but we properly split uh, what was running in the browser and what was running in the GPU process. That's for performance, for security, and all that. And remember that I spoke that we met this Riverman guy in Fosden. We've actually started to talk about what became in the future this project called Lacrosse. So during our development on Chrome OS side, you can flip, on, on Chrome OS side, they were maturing up the built-in compositor. So they've reached a point where we had a desktop Chromium Wayland implementation on top of this abstraction layer Ozone, and they have a mature built-in Wayland compositor running on top of Chrome OS. And we started to put those two uh, pieces together. So this is more or less uh, what Lacrosse is. So basically, that on Chrome OS, if, some, if the user launches the Chrome OS device, in the past, everything was running in one single process, including the browser. So the, the system, the, the UIs, the, the widgets, and the browser itself were one single process. It means that if Chrome crashes on Chrome OS, the whole system would go down, which is totally undesired. So the original goal that they had was taking the implementation that we were working for desktop, put on top of this compositor, and actually isolate the system from the browser. That was the original goal of Lacrosse. Yes, go ahead. That's how it began uh, some years ago. That's how it looks like today. And if someone looking in terms of functionality gains or functionality performance gains, our goal is not to have necessarily a performance or functionality gain, but to make it the flip over so that the users do not notice anything different. They just flip over to the new browser, standalone Lacrosse, 
and they don't know anything happened underneath things. Um, today, where we are, to, uh, we've, uh, we know Google actually is launching what they call Finch Trials, so they make available to users a percentage of users to launch Lacrosse by default without the user notice. And if we say tester, you can also get your commerce device and opt in to test stuff yourself, uh, which means test the Chrome Wayland on commerce devices uh, as well. So that's uh, kind of where we are today. Yeah, go ahead, Max. Right, and taking over like from where we are today with Lacrosse, let's take a look at where we are today with like regular Linux desktop, Ozone Wayland. Um, it is still like officially an experimental feature and you have to enable it manually. Um, as I mentioned before, you can either pass the Ozone platform command line flag and set it to Wayland, um, or there's also the Ozone platform hint command line flag, um, which if you set it to auto, does mostly what you want. Uh, I would argue if Wayland is enabled and like if Wayland is available on the compositor side, Chromium uses Wayland, and if it is not, it falls back to using X11. Um, and the Ozone platform hint is also uh, available as like a regular Chromium flag that you can set in like the graphical interface permanently um, if you don't want to pass it every time on the command line. Um, I was I was curious by something that uh, Antonio mentioned while we were preparing the, the presentation um, because many distributions use Wayland by default already. Um, but at least uh, I could only find two distributions that actually at least give the option to use Chromium with Wayland natively by default. Uh, Gen2 has a build time, of course, option to um, use uh, Wayland by default in Chromium. And also Alpine Linux has a wrapper script for Chromium that automatically passes the Ozone platform hint auto flag. Um, but the rest of the distributions, the user is um, responsible for manually enabling Wayland support in Chromium. Um, yeah, a, a very incomplete list of things that uh, used to uh, used to be broken, but uh, hopefully should work by now. Um, screen sharing, which was not so much a Chromium-specific problem, but more like a Wayland problem in general. Um, it works now using Pipewire. Uh, but I think we don't have the capability to share local audio. I think it only works for sharing what you are seeing. Um, IME works uh, in a basic form. I will, I will show you in a minute uh, what that explicitly um, means. Uh, yeah, testing also was something that gave me a lot of headaches. Um, because uh, Chromium has many test suits, and one of them is interactive UI test, which is like automated end-to-end -end testing, but no like pixel comparison of the outputs. Um, but still, there were some problems because uh, we needed a way to drive the tests, and we had no way to like inject any events of our own. So in the end, what we we ended up doing is we uh, we use Western as a compositor for our testing. Um, and we used, we, we created a new protocol extension that we implemented on the client side in Chromium and also in Western uh, that allows us to request Western to like pretend a user has moved the mouse, clicked the mouse, that kind of stuff. Um, because uh, the previous implementation used, uh, worked some, like s some, somehow. Um, but especially D and D things, or when you had multiple windows, was <coughs> practically broken. And also some graphical stuff um, like window decorations, rounded corners, uh, and things like that. And of course, uh, hardware acceleration uh, should also be working now. I think, like if you have some not very usual hardware setup, there might be some problems. Um, but it sh it, sh it should work. And yeah, don't just take my work f word for it. Mm -hmm. um, I can do a little bit of, of demos. Um, let's see. We can maybe first. Yes, uh, yes, I'm I I'm aware. Thank you. Uh, because that is full screen. 
Oh, that is very big. Um, we can first maybe uh, test the screen sharing. Um, Mozilla has a very nice test page for that, um, where you can do the screen capture. And then, OK, maybe I, I need to turn down the scaling like a little bit. Let's see how well fractional scaling works. There we go. Reasonably well, I think. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so yeah, the Chromium tab sharing is something Chromium specific. As soon as you want to share the window, like you notice the cursor changed, I can select the window. Um, I think I'm missing the confirm button because of the scaling, but yeah. Now we're seeing like the, the shared screen. Um, we can do, um, right, uh, tap dragging is like one of usually a nice feature in Chromium, but on Wayland, because we can't control the screen, uh, like the window position on our own, it is quite broken because we just get a new window and it doesn't move. Um, you can like merge with existing windows, but it's not a nice UX. Uh, so I've been working on a fallback um, for that. Um, which just uses like the regular drag and drop protocol, where instead of creating a new window, you just... Mm -hmm. Doesn't work. <laughs> ah, I think I still have like a... Sc yeah, I still have a Chromium session somewhere. No, no, we have like an actual different session. Um, you just get the drag icon and you only create the browser window when the user actually drops it. And yeah, it, it opens at a random position, but at least like it doesn't obscure while you're still dragging. Um, and also, uh, I can show you some IME stuff. Like the first basic IME thing is maybe you're familiar with the compose key like where you press a key sequence, uh, like a key, and then you can enter key sequences to com combine a key, like for German umlauts, for example, um, which was incidentally the first thing I ever worked on in Chromium because it was broken back then, uh, and I was very bothered by that. Uh, so it, you can press a compose key and then like combine characters like that. And also, um, I told you IME is in a basic working state. Let me show you what I mean by that. Um, I've just started Phytex, if that's how you pronounce it, in the background. And a very important distinction, you have to use GTK4, because GTK3 doesn't really work with IME. But, like, uh, not on, on <laughs> Wayland. On Wayland. Um, but I think now, yeah. I can at least type some Japanese, and you can, like, uh, you you now like if you press spacebar you should get a different wind like a like a small pop up giving you the different options. It is there. It's just on this screen. It's not on that one. Um, but that that one's on Chromium. Train the brain. Um, yeah, like a very small pop up. <laughs> it's also not high DPI. It's like blurry. Um, that's what I mean by basic support. So that one's probably not great if you rely on it. But it works to s to some degree at least. Um, so yeah, now let me get back to the presentation. So yeah, what is missing? Um, there are a few details to work out. Um, Nick uh, and Orko, who isn't here yet, I think, uh, are working uh, on this mostly drag and drop. As Martin uh, already mentioned, like it's difficult to uh, do everything correctly depending on which compositor you're act actually running under. So we need to like harden our implementation there. Um, fallback tab dragging uh, is still also experimental, but it should hopefully ship soon. There are some minor issues with fractional and mixed scaling that still need to be smoothed out, and of course IME. Although that is not just work that we need to do in Chromium, there's also still some discuss discussion going on 
regarding the IME protocols. Um, Chromium has some specific needs uh, regarding like web standards um, that they luckily have in mind now with the discussions. So we should hopefully see some progress on that front soon. That's it for now. Thank you for all your time. Thank you. <laughs> yes, questions? Thank you. That was a really uh, awesome talk. Thanks. Um, so I, my question was on the screen sharing thing that you showed. Um, that UI flow there seemed kind of confusing, where it like, showed you like a gray box and your cursor just changed. Is that something that's going to change? Oh, that way? is a compositor-specific thing. That is just like how things work on Sway, or at least how I set it up on Sway. I'm not sure. Uh, on GNOME, there's probably a more like user-friendly flow, I assume. OK. Like the, the thing that confused me the most was like this just empty black pop up uh, that you got there. Yeah, it is. Like uh, yeah, I mean like the 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 preview um, like y you can't of course uh, like the, the the thing with the cursor change was like the compositor asking me as the user for mm -hmm. permission which window to share and Chromium of course can't show the preview yeah. before I've given them permission so it was just like a black preview. But like as I said, um, there was some like. At the bottom of the pop-up, there should have been at least some buttons, so it shouldn't have been like just a black pop-up. Okay. There should have been a bit more than that, but that was missing due to like the the monitor setup. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions? Okay, sorry. Yes, hello. It's, it's more like a suggestion. Um, so in the previous two talks, there was was a problem to place the the window where you wanted with Wayland. So as so what a workaround I did with XG, uh, XDG shell, as soon as you as long as you can control the initial position, you can place the window relatively where you want it. So what I used to do is creating like a dummy buffer, like a transparent dummy buffer in maximized size, and then I could resize it and place it exactly where I want. So. I'm not sure whether this is a generic solution, so this worked in a scenario which was more simple than some of those desktop scenarios, but uh, that's something to consider and keep in mind, even though it wouldn't be like the most beautiful solution that could work, like to actually use a dummy buffer in the beginning, you know it's placed at zero, and, uh, and then you can resize it and place it, and that would enable you to have features like session restore and stuff like that. Just something to keep in mind. Maybe you already considered it, but uh, I used to do that with uh, Weston uh, on an embedded device. It worked, so yeah. So it was working across different compositors, like desktop and. Uh, so I'm not sure if this embedded. is uh, if that would be a generic solution that actually uh, okay. goes in line with the specification. Mm -hmm. I think that you can relatively place it according to the current position which usually the compositor chooses. Mm. But as long as you can control the initial position somehow, Got it. for example, by this workaround where you know it will, and that's the question. I'm not 100% sure that the compositor is in every case or every compositor will place it. If you have a maximized buffer and screen size, it will actually place it on the top left always. So I'm not sure. But in the case I, uh, I tested, uh, it did it reliably. And, uh, but it was a simple scenario. So the desktop might be more complex. There might be more windows. Maybe the compositor is not always doing that, but that's something you could uh, could look into. Yes, definitely. Yeah, it's an, an interesting suggestion. Thanks. Um, but I I think uh, <laughs> yeah, like the the cross compositor support will probably be difficult. I would also arg argue it's like not in the Wayland spirit. I, I think it's better to 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 try and and find solutions like upstream on the protocol level. But uh, it's interesting to have in mind like for if you need like a very specific scenario and need to make it work like more quickly than the upstream discussions uh, usually move. Yeah, it's, no, it's not the most beautiful solution. It's just to keep in mind that with some tricks you might be able to do what you want, but it's obviously not in line with, with the protocol overall. Okay. Do we have more questions? Please, yeah.
you said that IME was broken in GTK3? Uh, GTK3 with Wayland um, and probably like how Chromium uses GTK for the IME. Okay, because uh, I was weirded out by that statement and I just <laughs> ran a small uh, test case, like small app, and it seems to work for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it depends on like, first of all, like what you consider IME. Um, but yeah, like I think it's only like the, it's a special combination of running Chromium on Wayland with GTK3 and trying to use like an external IME program like IBUS or Phytex to do the actual IME stuff. That one does not work on GTK3 right now. Yeah, basically the way Chromium implements uh, what Max said, the way it implements editing with uh, text compositing and the way the protocol is designed, they are not very well compatible to each other. So what we hear from the Chromium folks, the Google Chromium folks, is that as long as the protocol isn't fixed, and he points out, the person points out the, 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 the flaws in the protocols, there's no way that they can work around things on Chromium side. So we've been uh, watching the discussions and somehow participating in the discussions in the protocol level and then there is a compositor side level implementation of those changes and then the adoption between the different compositors and then the cl client side implementation I, I, i'm getting a hint, a hint of where the problems might be because i'm join running, us, join us I, 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 I'm running <laughs> this in in nom so uh, when I said it to Japanese, for instance, as you did, mm -hmm. I actually get the pop-up, mm -hmm. but the pop-up is in the very characteristic style of GNOME shell, mm -hmm. which makes me wonder if it's actually coming from the compositor, just being told by some kind of API, hey, give this list of suggestions. But uh, the, the input method is actually not allowed to render uh, uh, its own uh, mini window as they used to be, uh, as, as they used to to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think the problem is like with uh, we are definitely abusing GTK for for IME. We we create like a dummy window. That's also the reason why the pop-up is in GTK4 on the wrong screen. And we inject custom keyboard events into GTK and then let GTK do the IME handling and grab the output of that. <laughs> and the problem is GTK3 does not allow us to inject these custom keyboard events. That was only added in GTK4, if I remember correctly. All right, thank you, Max and Antonio. We Finish? Yeah, yeah, thank okay. you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs>